attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Typo Terror, Hail Caesar, and Mystery Theater. Plus this day in history with OK Computer and our Song of the Day by Queens of the Stone Age on your Morning Monarchy for June 16th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us for independent, non-commercial alternative media. We've been online since 9-11-05, and we are brought to you by you. A huge thanks to all our friends at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's where we got the Bitcoin. Hey, what's nobody, nobody doling out the Bitcoin? <laughs> That's all right. I know it's through the roof. And there are the other cryptocurrencies that we should get into. I just haven't had the time yet. Ether and the rest. We've also got the classic post office box, which we appreciate. Getting real physical things in the mail. I was talking the other day. It's so, it seems more ancient and old school and classic as the days go by. We've also got paypal.me slash media monarchy. And of course, patreon.com slash media monarchy. That's the, really the best way to give us that monthly support that we need to keep going and growing. The way Patreon essentially works is it lets creators get paid for their work. Now, the way I have mine set up is monthly, because I do daily media. Now, there are other people who maybe they're writing comics. Patrons only get charged when they deliver another comic. It's really good. It's a nice, direct way to work with creator and audience, and it is, it's eliminating the middleman, except for Patreon being the middleman. And again, like a lot of the things that we talk about, it's not all about Patreon or Uber or any of the others. It's about the disruption. It's about the ideas. And I believe our latest patron... David H., huge thanks to him, and a huge thanks to you, and a huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app. They shared a nice nice screen grab and a tweet. Like, what do you want, Media Monarchy or the Richie Allen Show? All right, you crazy news junkies, have both. Also, a huge thanks to RadioConfluence.com. They simulcast and rebroadcast all your Media Monarchy broadcasts. That's your morning show, that's your music show, that's your New World next week, your good news next week. I am very happy to report server woes almost there. Stay on target. I had a hours long session with tech support chat last night as I got bounced around for a few different people. And finally, Shayna helped me out big time. And it still took a couple of hours. I believe we fixed everything. I think my SQL is updated and my C panel is updated. And I finally got to address the original problem that led us to discover the server woes in the first place. I just needed more space. I was out of space. I've bought more space. Hopefully, fingers crossed, everything should be back by this weekend. Now, I've been putting all your morning shows up on YouTube, and I'll continue to do that today. Probably have to chop off the Queens of the Stone Age track. <laughs> so you have to get that at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We are streaming live Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. You can hit that button. It'll open your VLC, your iTunes, your Winamp. Talk about classic. And it should play in some browsers as well. Now, I had a couple of different meetings this week. One with our new friend, Summit. And a huge thanks to him. Helped me work out some things. And we're also still looking at some chat and some stream solutions. So everything should hopefully only get better from here on out in the MediaMonarchy.com kingdom. So hopefully over this weekend, you might have to refresh and reload and do all that podcasty stuff as the episode should slowly start to populate. And again, as is typically the case... The tweets are going to give you the most recent updates. My email has come back to life, james at mediamonarchy.com. Love to hear from you. And of course, we're on Skype and we're on Wire. Those are my names, Media Monarchy. And we've also been using the Discord chat. We kind of dig it. If you hit up twitter.com slash mediamonarchy right now, you'll see a link over to the Discord chat where you can join us and take part in the show. So, okay, so that's the server woes thing I talked about. Mention the stream, mention YouTube. What I didn't mention actually was BitChute as well. Our morning shows have been going up on bitshoot.com slash channel slash media monarchy. I believe we're also just right there on the front page, which is sweet. The other thing to note, I've been, you know, bachelor cat dad all this week. And I know where Cassie is. She's in an airport in Phoenix as we speak. That's her layover on her way back, and we are very excited to have. Cassie coming back home. Hopefully you'll send out some good vibes as she is navigating the always nearly awful world of airports. I think everything's going fine, but just send some vibes for that safety. So I know where Cassie is. Meanwhile, I don't know where the hell Frankie went. I hope you're doing well, whether you're in a car or a cube or a garden, whenever, wherever you are, my friends. I'm glad you join us for these shows. As you know, we do a different topic each day of the week. It's sort of a different subject heading, if you will. 
probably say it along with me. Monday's world news, Tuesday's tech, Wednesday's food, Thursday is weird, and Friday is the entertainment industrial complex. I think I said I heard Clyde Lewis use those exact words the other night, and it's going to be a big one. Now, perhaps the biggest news of the day is the definition of food world order. Amazon to buy Whole Foods for $13.7 billion. Of course, Amazon stocks went up, Whole Foods stocks went up, and Walmart and their competition stocks all took a dive. The prospect of Trump firing Mueller becomes more untenable. Russian military says it might have killed ISIS leader. They think they might have whacked Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So we'll wait to see, and I'm not sure actually how many times he's already been killed, if he's one of those guys that they kill repeatedly. Hey, we killed the leader of the terror group we funded and created. The U.S. keeps effort to shield young immigrants from deportation. And the BBC asking the question, did the government act on advice? As I said yesterday, we're living right through a week that's essentially creating stories that people are going to argue about and speculate about for a long time to come. We are living in interesting times. And the lamestream headlines don't really stop there. I could keep scrolling down this page. Alex Jones scoops Megyn Kelly and proves the media isn't ready for the trolls. That's what BuzzFeed News says. And in some ways, they're right. They're not ready for a real independent alternative media which people like Alex Jones used to represent. I keep coming back to what we talked about on New World Next Week several weeks back when it was turning into the Alex Jones custody battle show. It's like, yeah, he's maybe kind of like Kiss at this point. Pretty embarrassing. I don't listen to it at all. But the influence is undeniable. Never really liked Kiss, but a lot of my favorite bands love Kiss. Sloan, they're huge, hugely influenced by Kiss. Ouch, indeed. The other lamestream news that, of course, suggested for me. The Smiths announced the Queen is Dead singles reissue. And the really ironic part about the Smiths is they had a, a great song, as their songs were all great, <laughs> about what happens at a record label when they love to crank out reissue, repackage, repackage. Reevaluate the songs, double packed with a photograph, extra track, and a tacky badge. They are exactly the thing that Morrissey sang about 30 plus years ago. And of course, it's kind of out of their hands because it's all owned by a major record deal. So that's a quick glance at your breaking lame stream news, my friends. Oh, wait, Lil Yachty, which apparently is a rap guy. He raps about 59 Simpsons characters in three minutes. We won't really have time for that today, but I probably have to check that out a little bit later. All the stories we're about to talk about have been tweeted out an hour ahead of time. And again, you can find those on Twitter moments. All the stories that we're going to talk about using hashtag media memes in the next 43 minutes. If you're listening along live, you can see the stories. And again, everything we say and play always included in the show notes. And let's begin with a little typo terror, because as we reach these points, and I often mention the terrible Steven Spielberg movie 1941. It's not a good movie, but the idea and what it shows I find really important, because I feel like we're kind of acting it out right now. Steven Spielberg's 1941 takes place right after Pearl Harbor, and it's basically the West Coast freaking out that an attack is coming. And it's basically a bunch of bumbling idiots thinking they see terror under every little bush and manhole cover. It's getting to be that point now. The two freelance Teamsters wore bracelets, allowing them unlimited access to the crowded event at Nürburgring. Nürburgring. Nürburgring, German media reported on Wednesday. However, police officers raised the alarm when they couldn't match their names to the list of staff provided by the organizers for the event on its opening night back on June 2nd. The names of the suspects were misspelled. State investigative police officer said, according to statements provided at this time, the authorities suspected a terror plot possibly linked with local Ismail Ismailists, Islamists <laughs> in the state of Hesse. The fears were likely boosted by the recent terror strike in Manchester. The situation was already very serious because we couldn't rule out the possibility of concrete preparations for a strike. Is that like in Japan where they've changed the definition of conspiracy to, oh, you might be planning some terror? Faced with this information, the police ordered a full evacuation of the festival on its opening night. 87,000 people get out. 
The authorities then conducted a search of the site and then gave the all-clear signal the next day, allowing the festival to continue. I've been telling you for the last year, and this was before the terror events really started, I only looked at the concert as situation as they want their money back. All the money we stole from them in the, in the late 90s and oddies online, they're gouging it back with their giant corporate festivals now. It's the only way they're making any money. I said, watch all these, all your concerts are belong to the powers that shouldn't be. Then the terror actually started. According to media reports, the two detained Syrians were hired by a subcontractor on short notice. In order to avoid confusion in the future, they've urged the organizers to provide personal documents ahead of times. Germany's top police officials also discussed the issue. According to the public broadcaster SWR, they aim to improve the security procedure by adding photos to all employees' passes, which would help the police verify their identities. Terror scare at the Rock am Ring music festival in Germany caused by a typo. German police ordered a large-scale evacuation at Rock am Ring Music Festival in early June after failing to identify two Syrian workers because it turns out that the workers' names were misspelled. And we see over in the chat our buddy Courage Sower talking about an Air Force base on lockdown. We saw that in Texas just the other, just the other day. Now, of course, they'll tell you, we just want to be safe. We just want to be safe. But we've been told they just want to keep us safe all the time. Generally, it seems that they just want to cover their own asses. While, of course, our asses, John Q. Dummy Public, we're all hanging out in the wind. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. It's the Media Memes Edition. So we get in with just a little bit of typo terror. I would say it depends on which festival you go to. They're saying festivals are garbage in the chat, and I would tend to agree. I did most of my festival going in the 90s. The only festival I would vouch for at this point is the one that I've spent a good bit of time at, and it's called Pickathon. It takes place at a farm for about three, four, or five days here in Oregon. Cassie and I have worked it the last couple of years. It's about as sort of idyllic, utopian, hippie, Oregon outdoor festival as you could maybe possibly imagine. It's pretty good. I recommend it to anybody out here in the Pacific Northwest. What I don't recommend and what I've never actually spent a dime on, any of the big, expensive New York theater shows. Now, I've seen theater a little bit in D.C., and of course, I worked a lot of theater in my college town. and even went to a massive theater festival called the Humana Festival in Louisville, Kentucky, decade plus ago. That was a big, massive theater festival. But as far as the big, expensive stuff in New York, why bother? Oh, oh, but, oh, but there's a little bit of controversy. It's not happening on Broadway. It's happening in the park. American Express now joins brands slamming Shakespeare in the parks, Caesar as Trump. I know you've heard about this story, and I was just kind of collecting up the headlines this week so we could talk about it on our Friday Media Memes edition. American Express is the latest public theater, so that's who owns Shakespeare in the Park, public theater. Amex, the latest to distance itself from Shakespeare in the Park's portrayal of Julius Caesar that overtly depicts the Roman leader as, of course, everybody's favorite villain, Donald Trump. A Trump lookalike, playing Caesar and dressed in a business suit and blonde hair, stabbed to death in the third act. Does that sound familiar? Apologies for the spoiler, but you had 400 years to read the play. Amex posted its response to Twitter on Monday saying, Its sponsorship of public theater does not fund the production of Shakespeare in the Park, nor do we condone the interpretation of the Julius Caesar play. That followed announcements Sunday by Bank of America and Delta Airlines. Such, such fantastic places. Because Bank of America has its, of course, its, its reputation to be concerned about. Bank of America, Delta Airlines, they pulled their sponsorship. Delta statement said the artistic and creative direction crossed the line on the standards of good taste. Hours later, B of A, B very of A, released a statement. Bank of America supports arts programs worldwide, including an 11-year partnership with the Public Theater and Shakespeare in the Park. The Public Theater chose to present Julius Caesar in such a way that was intended to provoke and offend. Had this intention been made known to us, we would have decided not to sponsor it. We are withdrawing our funding for this program. Bank of America sponsored Public Theater for 11 years and plans, to, of course, to continue its financial support, just, yeah, just not this time. 
The play's assassination scene has drawn comparisons to the legendary photo of Kathy Griffin holding a bloody Trump head which got her fired from CNN and Squatty Potty and essentially all her jobs and gigs. This is the connected part of all of these things. Everybody's waiting to get mad. We live in troll America. This is outrage culture par excellence. Everybody's waiting to get mad. Now, I talked recently, because it was just the 10th anniversary of when I posted it to MediaMonarchy.com, the, the theater festival I worked for back east. Now, I had since moved out here to Portland, but in 2007, they put on a show about Rachel Corey. My name is Rachel Corey, and they lost funding that year, and they lost funding from their wealthy Jewish funders. Now, same thing. They didn't stop and never come back. They just pulled their funding and pulled their name from that show. CNN's Fareed Zakaria hails Trump assassination play as a masterpiece. CNN serial plagiarist and, of course, CFR crony went to see a production of The Julius Caesar in Central Park. His tweet says, if you're in NYC, go see Julius Caesar, free in Central Park, brilliantly interpreted, interpreted for Trump era, a masterpiece. If you're wondering what exactly is that a prestigious CNN star and anchors praising is a masterpiece, there's video. Of course there's video. It's an actor dressed to look just like President Donald Trump as he's assassinated on stage. Look as his character is stabbed to death. And there's no mistaking the Trump connection. Check out the unbuttoned overcoat and red tie that hangs over his waist. It's a staging of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar that is outraging many. The controversial production is taking place here in New York City's Central Park. The staging is being seen as a direct jab at Trump and the controversial political climate in this country. There are other similarities to Trump. Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, bears a resemblance to First Lady Melania. Make hands for me! This is how the assassination scene has usually been done. Julius Caesar repeatedly stabbed by the members of the Roman Senate. In the new version, you see a bloodied Caesar, his white dress shirt soaked in blood. There was mixed reaction about this new twist. I didn't like that they made this person who looks like Trump get assassinated. Um, it's not a good message. I don't think it's disrespectful for the president to be murdered on stage. It's not really the president's theater. Everybody knows it's theater. This all comes on the heels of that outrageous image of Kathy Griffin holding the severed head made to look like Trump. She cried during a news conference where she was both defiant and apologetic. The apology absolutely stands. I feel horrible. As the cast took its bow, the audience applauded with a standing ovation. No word from the White House on the controversial production. Well, hell, I don't know if truer words were ever spoken. Everybody knows it's theater. You're goddamn right this is all theater. So even... Good God. These are the strange times. And again, these are the things I've talked about over the 12 years of doing Media Monarchy. When one party's in favor, I have to get my news from this other weird outlets. Then the other party comes in and, oh, now I've got tweets from Ann Coulter. Where she says, CNN's Fareed Zakaria hails Trump assassination play as masterpiece. His employer sponsors it. Uh, oh, wh which employer is that? Would that be CNN or would that be the Council on Foreign Relations? There's so many to try and keep up with. Now, of course... What dummy outrage culture, Jane Sixpack, Sally Soccer Mom, what they don't know. Guar's been beheading presidents for decades, R.I.P. Odorous Arungus. They even had tweeted out, they're like, Kathy Griffin, you stole our bit. But nobody knows about that. Nobody, nobody knows about Guar. People only know about the garbage they get on TV, like Kathy Griffin with Anderson CIA Cooper on the CNN New Year's ball drop. Yeah, we're all waiting for our balls to drop, aren't we? <laughs> You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so very much more. Coming to you, as always, from the Media Monarchy Studios. One last bit here as we hail Caesar and we hop over to The Hollywood Reporter. Time Warner CEO, which is about to be gobbled up by AT&T. Don't forget. 
Time Warner CEO Jeff Bukes defended the entertainment conglomerate's financial support of the public theater. So that's uh, Fareed's, some of his employers and paymasters. Bukes said Time Warner is proud to support the theater, though it doesn't necessarily support each production. We don't have a role in choosing or influencing which production they select or how they stage them. As was, of course, just noted in the chat, corporate funding is a double-edged sword. There was a nice indie upstart theater company out here in Portland that at some point was like, oh, they moved to the bigger theater. Oh, now they have to get fucking Ticketmaster deals. Oh, their sponsor's Boeing. Well, see ya. I'm not going to turn into a drama critic. The point of the play is one being debated for about 400 years. The killing of Caesar actually raises very important points about yabbity blah blah. So that's Bukes. About half the 300 people in the audience applauded while several others later approached the shareholder, David Almasi, to ask him questions. Bukes was responding to a challenge from a shareholder who asked, especially in the light of Wednesday's shooting of Republican Congressman Steve Scalise, how Time Warner can continue to support the public theater. Al Massey asked the question on behalf of the National Center for Public Policy Research, a think tank that is also a Time Warner shareholder and is known for accusing corporations of pushing liberal agendas. He also asked about Time Warner CNN. I I'm inquiring about CNN's bias and our return on investment, Al Massey told Bukes. Half the American public, which includes potential and current CNN viewers, voted for Trump last November and support his agenda. CNN acts as if it is part of the anti-Trump resistance. That's the heart of this message, and this gets to the part of of what you've heard me being angry about for the last near year. They act like they're actually part of some resistance. That's been the most frustrating thing when I talk about the people that you know closely. Who, Of course, I tried to talk about some of these things during the Bush years, and I was told, oh, I know things might be bad, but I just can't really, I just can't really go down that road and get all that bad stuff in my head. I was like, okay, I know you're trying to raise a kid, no biggie. Then Obama comes along, and I love politics, and oh my god, isn't he so great, and I cry, and I love him, and I'll give him a free pass while he kills little kids with flying robots for eight years and not say shit. Then suddenly, some TV jackass becomes America's next top president, <laughs> and to quote the Joker, everybody loses their minds. Yeah, we forgot about Obama as the Joker years before. Hey, welcome, Psychic Taxi, joining in the chat from Arizona. Appreciate you being here. We are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. You can get the Discord link in the tweets. That's been the really frustrating thing. And those of you that I've talked to personally, when I, when I, you can tell I'm very directedly kind of talking about people that I know. You know who I'm talking about. And you've got those people in your life. You act like you're part of some resistance, yet you work for the very same multinational sweatshop advertising corporations that actually cause a lot of the problems that you feign to be against when, of course, it suits you. When it's socially and politically expedient for you to post your pussy hats on Instagram and that you're part of the resistance. Oh, wait, I, I have to go to work for multinational corporations. <laughs> Like we said about Katy Perry yesterday, it's all so fucking contrived. Now, I made a reference earlier in the week. Oh, I got into a little bit of a quick Twitter tiff, as I, as I might be apt to do. I'm generally pretty nice, pretty accessible guy. But I'll go, I'll go scorched earth sometimes. We talked about the reboot when it was first announced several months back. And now, of course, of course, here comes the update. At Banff, ABC Entertainment President Channing Dungy said she isn't certain Roseanne Barr will name the U.S. president, but she's going to speak very honestly. Expect comedian Roseanne Barr to tackle Donald Trump and the current reality of ordinary Americans when a revival of her popular family sitcom debuts on ABC midseason. Brought to you by Disney. ABC Entertainment President Channing Dungy says, I don't know whether Roseanne will speak about Trump by name. We're going to be tackling some of the topics that are in the conversation today. I'll leave it at that. Original cast members, Roseanne Barr, John Goodman, Sarah Gilbert, Laurie Metcalf, Michael Fishman, Lacey Gordonson will return 30 years after the original Roseanne comedy debuted. This time with new kids and grandchildren thrown into the mix. Now, here's the funny part, and this is what actually kind of got into it with... It, it, it is. It is definitely 90s redux. Roseanne actually started, I think, in 88. But yeah, there are no original ideas. Hell, I, I went to see Def Leppard and Poison and Tesla last Saturday night. 
At least they've continued to always do their thing. Roseanne and others are, of course, opportunists. Oh yeah, she'll give some blah 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 about MK Ultra and talk some shit, but ultimately it's just about as much as Rosie or the rest of them. It's lip service. So I tweeted at Roseanne and kind of laughed and said, Oh, you're going to reboot it for the Trump, for the Trump administration, huh? What are you going to do about Dan? Because they killed him in the last episode. Oh, what are they going to do? They don't care. They're just going to act like it never happened. They're going to maybe, maybe they'll do like Patrick Duffy. They'll just kind of put him in the shower in Dallas. Oh, look, Dan's back. He didn't have a heart attack. It's all so opportunistic. So I basically called Roseanne and Moby, who we're going to talk about in a second, a couple of faded phonies. I was like, hey, Trump gave you guys new jobs. And I got fuck off from Roseanne, and she blocked me. Swagger Prince had to do the screen grab because I couldn't see it. It's like, well, how am I going to know you told me fuck off if, if you blocked me? These are the thin-skinned phonies. And we'll continue to laugh at them because we know that less and less and less people are watching. It's fewer people paying more for less. And that's happening on TV, and that's happening on movies, and that's happening everywhere. So we go from one faded phony to the next. Moby released These Systems Are Failing, which we talked about when it came out just, just less than a year ago. We actually played some of the cuts. On June 12th, Moby unveiled the second LP under the project, More Fast Songs About the Apocalypse. It's actually available for a free download. It'll be in the links. The project was announced with a jokey press release parodying Moby's nemesis, or at least one of his many nemeses, President Donald Trump, who Moby recently urged to resign. Now, remember, Moby also said he had some bombshell information proving the Trump-Russia connection. I keep tweeting about him about that. I'm just waiting for those bombshells. Come on, buddy. Drop them already. The PR is credited to John Miller, a name Trump once adopted when he was pretending to be his own publicist. And I won't read the thing. It's ridiculous. Moby releases a surprise album via Trump's alleged PR alter ego, John Miller, and says Moby is old and sad. And in some ways, yes. Let's continue to look at the media memes on your morning monarchy. My friends, Rolling Stone has settled a lawsuit with the University of Virginia fraternity whose members were falsely accused of raping a female student in November in a November 2014 article. A source involved at the national level with the fraternity Phi Kappa Psi tells the Daily Caller that Rolling Stone will pay $1.65 million to settle the defamation suit. Rolling Stone magazine has agreed to pay $1.65 million to settle a defamation lawsuit filed by a University of Virginia fraternity over a debunked story about a sexual assault on campus. The The settlement closes the final chapter of a lengthy legal saga sparked by the 2014 story, A Rape on Campus which was retracted after a police investigation found no evidence to back up the harrowing account of the woman identified in the story only as Jackie. The Virginia Alpha Chapter of the Phi Kappa Psi Fraternity said in a statement that its members are glad to be able to put the ordeal behind them. The story by Sabrina Rubin Erdley about Jackie's gang rape set off a firestorm at the university and in schools nationwide and prompted police to launch an investigation into the alleged assault. The article crumbled after other news outlets began asking questions and police found no evidence to back up any of Jackie's claims. The story was officially retracted in April of 2015. And this gets into a lot of my reasons. Hell, it wasn't even this serious. You've heard me complain about awful American music magazines that have fashion spreads and fucking video game reviews and all kinds of SJW claptrap. Like, I want to read about music. Not sure if you know that. (laughs) So this is the situation we find ourselves in. Outrage America. It's almost like you've seen those old Frank Luntz, you know, politics things. Hell, they even did it on The Simpsons when they were trying to dream up Poochie. (laughs) <laughs> you give people the little dial This is when you like what you see, turn it this way. If you don't like what you see, turn it that way. That's essentially how people date now, right? Swipe left, swipe right. It's all very black and white. Hero, villain, please choose. And we're all being told who to love and who to hate. And it all goes on in the two minutes hate. A really interesting story we have been following since it developed because we were already playing the songs. I've actually still got a couple of the songs in rotation. One month after 
sexual misconduct allegations torpedoed a promising new chapter in Power Bottom's career, resulting in the cancellation of a 36-city tour and the removal of the band's catalog from digital and physical retail and from virtually every streaming platform. The gender non-conforming punk duo Power Bottom has re-emerged with a new manager and the distro rights to its 2015 debut, Ugly Cherries. But the band's lawyer said the group has so far been unable to reach an agreement with Polyvinyl, the indie label that released, then withdrew, Power Bottom's already well-received second record, Pageant, to make it available again. Power Bottom singer-guitarist Ben Hopkins and drummer-singer Liv Bruce have been working with a new manager, Lisa Barbaris, who reps Cindy Lauper and others. Attorney Jeff Koning of Serling Rooks, Hunter McCoy, and War Rob, good lord, to reclaim the band's music. In May, an unnamed person and an acquaintance speaking on their behalf accused Hopkins of sexually predatory behavior just days before Pageant was released, although the band contested the claims within days of the accusations. It was, a, it was an amazing destruction. And again, we followed it and, and talked about it here. Power Bottom got dropped by Salty Artist Management, Father Daughter Records, which had released Ugly Cherries, and Polyvinyl, their new label at the time, which was going to drop Pageant, and had. It's already $40, $50, $60. Dollars. You can find it on Discogs. Although no charges have been filed, and to date, no additional accusations have been made, both albums were withdrawn from distro, effectively wiping out Power Bottom's entire catalog. New manager Babaris, a major label vet who was director of press and artist relations for Electra Asylum Nunsuch, which are all under the Time Warner banner, before opening So What Management on her own in 94, said she wasn't familiar with Power Bottom or Polyvinyl. Well, oh, that's bad prior to the, le to the learning of the band's predicament. Quote, But to see Polyvinyl derail and potentially destroy the band's career in such an impulsive manner is very troubling. I've never seen a label respond in such an irresponsible way in the 30-plus years I've been in the music business. A month removed from the sexual misconduct allegations that derailed the band's album release and potentially their career, Power Bottom has a new manager and also have attained the distribution rights to their 2015 debut album, Ugly Cherries. The band is now working with manager Liz Barbaris, who also represents Cindy Lauper. Barbaris is a major label veteran who is also formerly director of press and artist relations for Electra Asylum Nonesuch Records before opening So What Man Management in 1994. I've never seen a label respond in such an irresponsible way in the 30 plus years I've been in the music business, Barbara said in a statement provided to Billboard, referring to Polyvinyl's decision to drop the band, ceasing support almost immediately following the allegations. Speaking of Polyvinyl, so far the label and band have not been able to reach a viable agreement that would make their latest album, Pageant, available again. According to attorney Jeffrey Koenig, Polyvinyl wants to be reimbursed for the unrecouped advance it gave Power Bottom to make the record before it will transfer distribution rights to the group. As far as legal action going forward, a source close to the band tells Billboard that the band does not want to sue, but are of the belief that their former label has done harm to their reputation and livelihood. Well, that's, that's what'll get you. That's what'll screw you. It's all about the advance. Don't take that advance, or at least don't blow that advance. Outrage culture. No evidence, no charges filed, just a complete career destruction. Now again, we're not necessarily rah 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 with the SJW push of Power Bottom. We're mostly in it for the music, as we are in most situations. Art greater than artist. But we also talked about this, or at least I discussed it on the Twitter feed if I didn't actually make it into a news story. There was also a band, there is a band, called Beach Slang. Same thing. Accusations came out, what happened? The band completely fired their longtime friend and founder of the band. Everybody's so afraid to get caught in the crosshairs of outrage culture. And it's already bloody summer. And it's not even officially summer. So pretty bad form from Polyvinyl. And I've been a fan of the label for a long time. They are a long-running indie label. I have tons of things on Polyvinyl. And they've had a lot of great bands on the label. I'm actually super jazzed on their band White Reaper right now. They're on Polyvinyl. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. We're doing the media memes headlines, and there's still a lot to go through, so I'll speed it up. As turnarounds go, this one is a disaster. At Radio Giant Cumulus, things have gone from bad to worse. A quick look at the stock price tells the tale. When Chief Executive, rather former Chief Executive, Lou Dickey took off in September 2015, the stock was an anemic $5.45. Last Friday, $0.52. Cents. 
Back in the halcyon days of early 2014, way back then, Cumulus stock was trading at 6404. Now it's in tatters, and they might even get delisted by NASDAQ, and they might be looking at a possible bankruptcy. Cumulus Media on the brink of a complete and total collapse, and they syndicate a lot of your favorite knee-jerk fake right shows. The popular Bridge School Benefit concert that Neil Young has hosted for the past 30 years will not take place in 2017, and the future remains unclear. Bridge School announced the news in a statement written, written by Peggy Young, Neil Young's ex-wife, on its website this past Wednesday under the headline, No Bridge School Benefit Concert 2017. The school, would f the school was founded by Peggy Young in 1986 for kids with severe speech and physical impairments after she and Neil Young had trouble finding a suitable school for their nonverbal son, Ben Young, who has cerebral palsy. He's currently the president of the board of directors. The Bridge School Benefit Concert, traditionally held at the Shoreline Amphitheater, will not be held in 2017. We want to express our sincere and profound thanks to all of you for your love and support demonstrated by way of your attendance at 30 years of Bridge School Benefit Concerts. Although I will continue fundraising efforts for personal reasons beginning this year, I will no longer be hosting the Bridge School Concert. So that's another one down in flames. Now, a little bit of schadenfreude, I can, we, we can enjoy that. We can dive into a little bit of shameful joy. Hollywood may never forget the weekend of right now, June 16th. Tinseltown box office already down is heading to three gigantic flops this weekend. Major stars, major directors involved. The Book of Henry from Jurassic World director Colin Trevorrow. There have been a few screenings and no reviews, and the reviews that have come out are all really, really bad. Second on the list is All Eyes on Me with a Z, because guess what? Spoiler, when we hit this day in history, it's Tupac's birthday. All Eyes on Me, that's also going to bomb today. And there's also expected to be Scarlett Johansson and Kate McKinnon in Rough Night from Columbia Pictures. And I think that basically looks like a kind of a snuff film, or is that one of those very bad things, but it's all women who kill a guy and try and cover it up? I think that's what it is. Because, of course, you know, finally now women are being pandered to. Thankfully. Woo! And even gay men as well. You can have your... <laughs> you can have your rainbow french fries at McDonald's, and I even heard they might do a gay men reboot of Golden Girls, which was actually the original setting of the entire show. Three big box office disasters coming this weekend, and everybody already knows the new Tom Cruise movie. He's a big piece of shit. <laughs> Even when you read the words re rebooting Brendan Fraser's classic, it's like Brendan Fraser's classic aren't words that go together. Good news for Spotify. They announced they have 140 million monthly active users, up from 100 million a year ago. They added 40 million people in just one year. And I would say the reason is, it's a good service. It's way easy to use. It's much more user-friendly than anything from Apple or Pandora or the rest of them. Punching you in the friend face. Oh man, Floyd Mayweather Jr. will come out of retirement to meet UFC star Conor McGregor in an August 26 boxing match that will feature two of the top-selling fighters in the world. This, I think, is also an interesting thing that shows how much disruption has been going on around the world. Talk about Sirius and XM, the satellite stations. They were never going to survive separately. That's why they had to merge. Oh, Cassie's tweeting me about the Amazon buyout. But yeah, that's the thing. So suddenly, as even our buddy Gerder was talking about, we're going sidebar here, Whole Foods. Suddenly, in one move, GMOs are all fine and safe, and they can be delivered to your door with a drone. And they've got all kinds of patents. This is going to be a match made in Food World Order. But now back to the musical notes. As our friend Summit notes, still prefers buying music rather than renting it via Spotify. Absolutely. And I've talked about this before. You're going to spend all your time building all these digital things that don't exist? Oh, but they'll be around forever. Oh, yeah, right? Just like Blockbuster? Just like Cumulus Media? Just like Yahoo? I want physical media. That's why I've been collecting it all my life. Yeah, I have the collector disease. But I think this boxing and UFC mix shows long-time things are not going to continue. They have to merge. Now, I did ask one of, my, one of my more conventional friends, and I was even laughing this morning, actually. 
My buddy Herm, he's he's recovering right now. He had his appendix taken out. He's one of my more mainline friends, total Trump supporter, total sports fan. We really aren't similar at all, but we met back at the commercial radio station, and even though we are probably two of the most different people, he's about the only guy I still keep in touch with. We actually both really get along. I asked him. I was like, oh, so, so Mayweather's going to get the shit beat out of him, right? He's like, no, 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 no. Because they're going to do it as a boxing match. The way I was explained to it, and again, I'm not giving you any betting advice. If they're doing a boxing match, Mayweather's going to win. If they were doing an ultimate fighting, ultimate punching contest, McGregor would probably win. Whichever ring they were in that the other guy knows better, that's going to be the guy that's going to win. This week has kind of been a holy hexes week all week long. Even our Food World Order edition felt pretty dark and pretty weird. And we've seen the memes and themes. That's why we keep returning to our buddy Lauren Coleman and the copycat effect. And all the synchro mystic things going on. I've mentioned Towering Inferno several times this week. And I thought I had mentioned this obituary we're about to go over quickly. But I hadn't. The date didn't check out. Our buddy Sean Cathcart tweeted this story one week ago after I was off the air with last Friday's Media Memes edition. And I realized... I've been watching one of my new favorite YouTube channels is called Trailers from Hell. It was actually started by Joe Dante. And it's basically filmmakers talking over trailers of movies they like. And it's a lot of exploitation, grindhouse, horror, sci-fi, B-movie kind of stuff. And one of the trailers from Hell I watched was for Towering Inferno. The 70s were all about the disaster movies. Cinematographer Fred Konenkamp, who won an Oscar for the 1974 disaster epic The Towering Inferno, has died at the age of 94. Cinematographer Fred Konenkamp has died. He was 94. Konenkamp won an Oscar for the 1974 disaster epic The Towering Inferno. According to a representative for the American Society for Cinematographers, they said on Friday that Konenkamp died on May 31st. He had over 90 credits to his name and often collaborated with director Franklin J. Schaffner. He earned Oscar nominations for Schaffner's Patent and Islands in the Stream. He was given the ASC Islands Lifetime in Achievement stream. Award in 2005. Gunn Camp was born in Los yeah, Angeles to an Oscar-nominated cinematographer father. He also worked on Papillon and Gunsmoke and Amityville Horror, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and Fun with Dick and Jane. Keith Richards devastated following the death of former lover and mother of his kids, Anita Pallenberg. R.I.P. Rolling Stones guitarist and Anita were together for 12 years, had three kids together, and she exists as quite the inspiration. She also dated the late Brian Jones and probably had a fling with Mick Jagger. Now, as we start to wrap up our media memes, I've got some musical notes I want to make for you. And I said in our intro, I said it's Typo Terror, Hail Caesar, and Mystery Theater. Well, the mystery theater is mm, kind of a tease. So today is the third Friday of the month. That is typically when we do book smarts. We'll do book reviews. <sighs> Truth be told, I don't have one prepped for you. So I apologize. I do not have my book review homework. What I will do, speaking of mystery theater, is just make the reference and maybe put the call out. I was a huge fan of the Vertigo comics from DC back in the 90s. The Invisibles are... A I would like to do an episode talking about The Invisibles. If there are any Invisible scholars out there, of course, Grant Morrison's fantastic book from the late 90s. It pretty much presaged 9-11, The Matrix. It was all in there. If anybody is an Invisible scholar, hit me up, james at mediamonarchy.com. I want to do an episode talking about Invisibles. I enjoyed the Preacher AMC TV series. I have an entire run of Preacher comics. I pretty much have runs of all those DC Vertigo comics. Preacher, Invisibles, pretty good run on Sandman. And I have the entire series of Sandman Mystery Theater. So basically, to capitalize on the success of Neil Gaiman's Sandman Dream, DC Vertigo resurrected the Golden Age version of Sandman, which was essentially kind of like the Shadow doesn't have any actual, like, superpowers, but it's set in the 40s. I loved Sandman Theater. Sandman Mystery Theater, it's called. They were always in four-issue arcs, and it just felt very classic. 
So as we're continuing to build the MediaMonarchy.com kingdom, I'm trying to institute and incorporate more things where we can get together and talk and hang out. I'd love to have a weekly hangout with subscribers. And also, kind of a group where we can talk about books, we can talk about records, we can talk about films and art. Again, we'll do all this with your support. These are all the plans. I got lots of plans and schemes to build a big independent media monarchy. Queens of the Stone Age announced new album, Villains, produced by Mark Ronson. It's not going to come out until August 25th, but just yesterday they shared the first taste of it, The Way You Used to Do, and that's going to be our song of the day at the end of this episode. And again, if you are listening on YouTube because we're still working out our server was, this song is probably not going to be in this YouTube upload. <laughs> so we'll get to that in just a few minutes, but I also want to quick remind you Friday is New Music Friday tons of records coming out today holy moly Lord Fleet Foxes Ride Matthew Sweet Cheap Trick Jason Isbell Moby Thelonious Monk Steve Earle Gospel Beach Can Nickelback Goldie Portugal the Man there here in Portland Kevin Morby Styx Allison Moyette Calm Truce Royal Blood Hey Violet Pale Hound Rips Michael Now. We played a lot of these new cuts on your daily DJ set at noon. Holy moly, I keep scrolling. There's just more and more and more albums. That'll be in the tweets as well. Hashtag New Music Friday. And we'll have that new Queens of the Stone Age song coming up here in just a few minutes. But let's take a look at this day in history. It's a really interesting one. And I find the, the Amazon Whole Foods announcement. Interesting in light of what I see on this day in history. I'm going to speculate that since this is right about the part where it's the end of the fiscal year, this is probably when big financial moves are made. June 16th, 1858, Abraham Lincoln delivered his house divided speech on this day in Springfield, Illinois. 1903, the Ford Motor Company was incorporated on this day. June 16th, 1904, Irish author James Joyce begins a relationship with Nora Barnacle and subsequently uses the date to set the actions for his novel Ulysses. This date, now called, as is already trending, Bloomsday. June 16th, 1911, IBM founded, originally as the Computing Tabulating Recording Company in Endicott, New York. June 16th, 1944, at age 14, George Junius Stinney Jr. becomes the youngest person executed in the United States in the 20th century. June 16th, 1955, in a futile effort to topple Argentine President Juan Perón, rogue aircraft pilots of the Argentine Navy dropped several bombs on unarmed crowds demonstrating in favor of Perón in Buenos Aires, killing 364 and injuring at least 800. At the same time on the ground, some soldiers attempt to stage a coup but are suppressed by loyal, loyal forces. On this day, Rudolf Nureyev defected from the Soviet Union in 1961. 1962, Isley Brothers dropped Twist and Shout. 67, Monterey Pop Festival started. 72, Ziggy Stardust was released. 1975, John Lennon sues the U.S. government, charging that officials tried to deny his immigration through selective prosecution. 1976, it's the Soweto Uprising, a nonviolent march by 15,000 students in Soweto, South Africa, turns, of course, into a day of riding when the cops start firing on the crowd. 1977, Oracle Incorporated on this day by Larry Ellison, Bob Miner, and Ed Oates. 1981, Reagan awards the Congressional Medal of Honor to Ken Taylor, Canada's former ambassador to Iran for helping Americans. Six Americans escaped from Iran during the hostage crisis, because I'm sure that's exactly how that played out. He was the first foreign citizen bestowed the honor. Yeah, Canadians, you're taking our Congressional Medal Medals of Honor, too. On this day, 1992, Sister Soldier called future U.S. President Bill Clinton a, quote, draft-dodging, pot-smoking womanizer. 95, Pearl Jam begins a tour without using Ticketmaster, and it doesn't go so well. And on this day, 20 years ago today, OK Computer taught the band to play. I think it would have been, it would have been wonderful if we had um, basically done, if we carried on in the Ben's way, it would have been great for the accountants and everybody. Um, but as usual, we've screwed it up. <laughs> um, because we had to, because we were somewhere else. huge Radiohead fans have said, said to me, honestly, first listen, I'm really disappointed because I was expecting a kind of a Benz Mark II. And that's exactly what we didn't do.
then when it came to the end of it, it was like, oh, <laughs> you know, people, people are going to have to make an effort. Uh, and I had sort of a sleepless, basically a sleepless week, where I sat down and I tried to put it together in a way that would make it more acceptable. I just turned myself into a maniac, actually. And the others were like not talking to me, and I kept sending them tapes of, of the order of the track, saying, "Here you go, here you go. It's all right now. I'm, you know, it's it's understandable. People will get it really quickly. It'll be great." I suddenly got really anxious because it wasn't it wasn't the bends. You know, it wasn't. It didn't have that. It, had, it, it demanded a degree of effort. But then, all my favourite records were like that, so it didn't matter. Anything that you do that you're trying to do that's different, it is going to be challenging. It is going to take a couple of listens to get into. The single Paranoid Android is certainly challenging, but Radiohead's experimentation seems to have paid off. When we set up our studio and we were recording, we listened to a song by the Beatles called um, I Am... Was it I Am the Walrus? No, it's actually Happiness is a Warm Gun. Happiness is a Warm Gun. Well, there's a song anyway where they take lots of different bits and they stick it together. And we thought we'd have a bash at that ourselves. And, um, and then Paranoid Android is kind of a result of that, so we kind of recorded different bits and just stuck it together randomly. And um, it, it worked out quite nicely, really. And it wasn't too hard for the band to find a star for their video. When we were doing the artwork, I had a tape of all the Robin cartoons and I used to just get drunk and watch them and watch him get drunk and, uh, and just think, that's me. You know, that is me. Paranoid Android, like the rest of OK Computer, is certainly unique and challenging. But whether you like it or not, the band at least are happy with the results. I had the, I had the hate it all, I love it all, I hate it all, I love it all, I hate it all, I love it all for, for, for the whole year that we did it. All the time, and people used to ring up. Friends of mine ring up, and, and I just bend their ear for an hour. And, and now it's sort of, it's somebody else's. You know, I love it now, and it's somebody else's. So that's great. You know, it's 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 a third record, and I think people give you, I think people will give us a break, and we'll give it a chance, and, and that's that's what we need. OK Computer released 20 years ago today. Continuing to look at this day in history, actually, I'll make the quick note. That was the point, and he even said it there in the interview. I think everybody wanted us to make bins again. That was pretty much how my brother was. He was like, mm, I don't like all this stuff. I want the bins. So he kind of tuned out and went foo. It's one of the many divides between me and my brother as the years have gone by. TMI. Hey, coincidentally enough, this day in history, right after that Radiohead, June 16th, 2000, Israel complies with United Nations Security Council Resolution 425. 22 years after its issuance, which called on Israel to completely withdraw from Lebanon. Israel does so, except for the parts that they don't. 2012, China successfully launched its Shenzhou 9 spacecraft carrying three astronauts, including the first female Chinese astronaut. On that same day, the United States Air Force's robotic Boeing X-37B space plane returned to Earth after a classified 469-day orbital mission. We reported for you this week, of course, that Elon Musk joined the military, and he'll be helping launch that. And on June 16th, 2015, America's next top president announced his candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Simpsons did it. Published a Media Monarchy a decade ago today, Corporations in the Classroom, a documentary about marketing to school-age students being a $2 billion industry. Now, unfortunately, as are some of the old video links on the website, yeah, Google Video doesn't exist anymore, so that link is dead. One of these days, we'll be able to go back through the archives, update everything. I love that idea. And again, I'd love to get your help doing that kind of stuff. If you'd like to help out the MediaMonarchy.com kingdom, I don't necessarily want to have to do everything by myself. I'd like help on things. James at MediaMonarchy.com Celebrating birthdays today, June 16th, Adam Smith, Geronimo, Stan Laurel, Joyce Carol Oates, Billy Crash Craddock, and the 33rd governor of the 33rd state, that's Oregon, and also noted rapist Neil Goldschmidt. 
It's also Eddie Levert's birthday, Gino Vanelli's birthday, and the ultimate warrior, a wrestler I have heard of, but also, funnily enough, the Sandman. Wrestler I haven't actually heard of. And born on this day, 1971, Tupac Shakur. I don't think any of those folks will make it into our Pump Up the Volume because it is a new Music Friday, and I will wet that whistle with brand new music from Queens of the Stone Age as we wrap up another week of Morning Monarchy, my friends. We will continue to stream live Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, mediamonarchy.com slash listen. We do your Morning Monarchy at 9, and I replay it at 2 p.m. Pacific Time. We do your Pump Up the Volume at noon Pacific Time, and we replay it at 4 Pacific Time. Tell a friend, make an enemy. We are building independent, non-commercial alternative media thanks to you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. I appreciate you so much. There it is, your Friday, June 16th, 2017, Media Memes edition of your Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato again, thanking you so much for listening. And reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.